Okay, so I want to talk today about um, this new book called Zone to Win, Organizing to Compete in, a, in an Age of Disruption. The key idea here, the challenges that we're taking on, the challenge we're going to take on is, you know, we, we see a lot of waves of innovation coming through the culture and how do large companies catch the next wave. It used to be called the Innovator's Dilemma by, by Clayton Christensen. It's an ongoing problem. I think it's about time that we kind of nailed it. And, my proposition is that zone management will help do that. So we're going to talk about zone management uh, in terms of what the concepts are, how you would organize differently from the way you might be organized today, not as differently as you might think, and then what is zone to win uh, in terms of activating these ideas and, and taking them forward in your company. So just to put the challenge down, look, we're living in an amazing era. We, we know this. We, we're watching the digital transformation of the entire planet. We see these, these wave after wave of digital innovation coming out, cloud computing, smartphones, social networks, data science, Internet of Things. And I think that the key thing to register here is why is, this, why is it so disruptive? And the answer is these technologies are making things that used to be very scarce and expensive ubiquitous and cheap. So in this new world that we're creating here, automating any service, essentially using, using software to change anything, is becoming incredibly cheap. This is why a guy like Mark Andreessen can say software is eating the world, because it's becoming extremely prevalent, because it's very cheap to, to promulgate. Smartphones let us connect with anybody, a billion people on the planet, essentially for free. So all of a sudden we can now communicate at a level, at a scale, and at a cost that we never could before. Social networks let groups of people uh, tap into the trap capacity they have in free time. If you look at something like Uber or Airbnb, you're seeing how, the, how again, we're, we're creating ubiquity and cheapness for things that used to be scarce and, and, and expensive. Data science itself is expensive, but it's allowing us to optimize digital systems on an ongoing basis through machine learning so that they get smarter and smarter and smarter, better and better. And now with Internet of Things, we're going to be able to apply the same strategy to physical systems in the physical world. And the, so the net of all these things, if you want to kind of net it out into a sentence, I think it is the design rules for how you engage with the world are changing, which means every existing system has to be rethought from the ground up in terms of when do we want to adopt the new design rules, how are we going to leverage this capability. And this means you've got to catch the next wave. Well, when you look at the history of tech, it's, not, it's a landscape which is not very encouraging. These are tech leaders from the last several decades who, who were leaders in their field and did not catch the next wave. And these are not the bad companies. These are the winning companies. These were our best management teams. So I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what is so hard here? What is going on? Why do, why do established enterprises have such a challenge in catching the next wave? It's not that they're not trying to. Every one of these companies had a plan to, but it didn't, it didn't work. So what's going on? I think our friends at McKinsey, a guy named Merdad Bagai and several of his colleagues wrote a book called The Alchemy of Growth. And in it, there's a framework that I think casts direct light on what the exact challenge is for, for a, an established enterprise with disruptive innovation. What they said is when you look at the annual planning processes of a large corporation, you, you, when they allocate resources, you want to divide up the, the, uh, the pie into three uh, return horizons. And the first horizon, called Horizon 1, means I'm going to give you money this year and you're going to pay me back this year. You're going to give me more sales or more products, and I'm going to get my return in the same year that I give you the money. Most established enterprises do extremely well here. It's how they got to be big. It's how they got to stay, get to stay big. The thinking for a long time was the problem is they're not very good at Horizon 3. But it turns out that's not true. Horizon 3 is a chance to do advanced R&D, to do, to do skunk works kinds of ideas. Actually, large companies do very well here, too. The challenge that they have is in the middle. It's when I want to give money to something that's not going to make a return this year. It may break even next year, probably not quite. But then the following year, it's going to turn the corner. This is where we, uh, our, our large uh, enterprises get stuck. And we, in, a, in venture capital, we call this the J-curve. The idea behind the J-curve is you, things get worse before they get better. It's a little bit like Dante's Divine Comedy. You have to go through Inferno to get to Purgatorio and then to Paradiso. And that's fine for venture-backed institutions because venture capital is designed to invest in J-curves. That's the whole premise of venture capital. But public capital, publicly held co companies are not. And public investors get very uh, nervous when they see a J-curve unfolding. 
the, the, the challenge inside the company is it's a very expensive new sales force you've got to uh, put out there, uh, new supply chain, uh, there's very little revenue, typically there's, there's negative cash flow. From a financial performance point of view, things look worse, not better. And so investors can often get spooked at this time. At the same time, the, the sales team is looking at the new opportunities, and while they're very exciting and they've got a certain amount of cachet, the truth is they don't really know the people they're supposed to be selling to. These are not their traditional customers. Even in the accounts where they're already established, they've got to make new relationships, probably in new buildings. Um, they have to create budget before they can compete to consume it, meaning nobody has a budget for the new stuff yet. They, they think it's exciting, but, but they haven't actually budgeted for it. So you can see how the sales motion is going to be longer and more complex. And so the salespeople who want to make quota this year, they get cold feet and they start to withdraw their support. And then if you look at their management teams, their management teams are saying, look, I have a finite amount of talent. I need to make my number this year. You know, this is a sales, marketing, and professional services envelope I run. I need these people. And you can't keep sending them over to this inefficient sales motion. I will miss my number. So then the sales management itself withdraws support. It's a very common, this dynamic happens over and over and over again. And the key insight here is it's not an R&D problem. Not to say that it can't be R&D challenges as well, but primarily it's a go-to-market challenge. And so how the, the real question we have to face is, how do you solve the go-to-market challenge of Horizon 2? That's the problem statement. The way to think about it is, if you have a sustaining innovation that's not disruptive, you can think of life as a funnel, and Horizon 2 is simply a stopping point or a stage on the journey from Horizon 3 to Horizon 1. But if you have a disruptive innovation, it's an hourglass. And Horizon 2 is a bottleneck, and getting through the Horizon 2 bottleneck is the thing that most established enterprises fail to do. It's what those 54 companies on that earlier slide failed to do. So, okay, so great, that's the challenge. How are we going to solve for this? And the key idea behind solving it is the notion that when you look inside the enterprise, there are areas of, of activity that have to be managed separately. And the first key idea is you've got to separate the work that you're doing sustaining your existing businesses from the work that you would do to, to, in the disruptive stuff. And that's pretty obvious. Most companies, by the way, do this automatically. They, they have an established uh, uh, set of uh, relationships and procedures and processes and funding, and they're typically in buildings A through N. And then the disruptive innovations are typically done in a skunk works environment somewhere off, uh, off to the side or whatever. And people keep them separate because disruption is not and sustaining don't get along very well. The other place we, which you have to be thoughtful about, though, is what are the organizations that are producing the revenue that we're counting on this year versus where are we making enabling investments or just, frankly, spending money on cost centers? When you use this two-by-two two matrix, three organizations come into view very quickly, and they should be very familiar to anybody on this call who works in a large corporation. The first we call the performance zone. This is, this is our Horizon 1 zone, and this is where the people who make what you sell and sell what you make live. They live in the performance zone. And we're going to dig into each of these zones a little bit in just a minute. But if you have a number in your compensation plan, if you have a revenue number because you own a product line, or you have a bookings number because you own a sales responsibility or a territory, you're in the performance zone. If you don't have a number in your comp plan, you're probably in the productivity zone. The productivity zone is all of the cost centers that work behind the scenes to do all the work that's necessary to make the performance zone successful. So this, you will see, we'll dig into this a bit too. Marketing, finance, legal, facilities, customer support, anything that doesn't have a number, it's part of the, the, the current sort of way of doing business is in the productivity zone. And those two together are really the bulk of any large corporation by far. But most large corporations in an age of disruption have also funded an incubation zone. And this could be R&D labs, but in addition to that, it could be skunk works, it could be small tuck-in acquisitions, it could be groups that are going off and exploring new things. And, and, and they're funded separately, and, and their resources are kind of hived off from the rest of the corporation. And they're supposed to be agile and fail fast and move fast. And those three zones, show up in most large corporations today, and they're, they're relatively stable, and people have relatively, relatively good confidence that they know how to run them. It's the force zone that causes the issues. 
The fourth zone we call the transformation zone. It's horizon two. This is where you solve for the problem of the J curve in horizon two. And unlike the other three, it's not a real zone, meaning it, 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 it blinks in and out because there's no building for the transformation zone. The transformation zone is actually being the number one agenda item on the CEO's to-do list, but it's not, it's not a separate organization, as we're going to see uh, when, when we look into that. So the challenge then is going to be each of these zones has their own mission and playbook. We're going to be particularly interested in the transformation zone, but frankly, since most of us on this call don't work there, that we work in one of the other three zones, what I first want to do is talk about how your zone can up its game so that when you come to do a transformation, your company can have more success in it. So I'm going to talk briefly about the other three zones, then we'll, then we'll take a, a, a deeper dive into the transformation zone. So each zone has its own mission. Let's talk about the performance zone. This is one that's very familiar to anybody in it. The job here is to deliver bookings, revenues, contribution margins, and Horizon 1. And most performance zones are organized around numbers, so you can see we have numbers on this thing. The columns in this matrix are people who sell stuff, and the rows are people who make stuff. And the makers have to make a number. They, 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 at the end, of their compensation is designed on making a revenue number. Uh, the salespeople's compensation is based on making a bookings number, and it's all supposed to add up to the annual plan. And when you look at that model, you say, okay, so how does it work? The model is based on performance metrics. This is not about kumbaya. This is not about a happier customer or whatever. This is about bookings, revenue, contribution margins, churn, growth rate. It, it, it's a very mathematical exercise. It's a data-driven exercise. You either did or did not make your number. Now, the key places, if you look at this thing, and most people understand this, this is not new news, but there are places where people get sloppy with the performance zone. One is on this notion of interlock. In this model, every, every row and every uh, column is responsible for the squares uh, 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 on its row or column. And there should be a single point of control, a single person who owns all the column, all of one column or all of one row. And they have the, the number at the end of the row or the column. When they intersect, when a col wherever a column intersects a row, there are two owners. And interlock means that both owners accept joint responsibility for making the number in that cell for every quarter and at the end of the year. Uh, and so that's called cell level interlock. And what that does is that creates immediate visibility and accountability as to where we're making our numbers and where we aren't. No, no row or column should be less than 10% of the total. That's a key idea because otherwise this matrix becomes unmanageable. You have tiny little rows that are spread across many columns. Nobody can pay attention to them. The same thing with a tiny column spread across many rows. If it's not at least 10% of your, of your um, of your opposite numbers uh, uh, quota, then it's, it, it's just very, very hard to pay attention to it. So no subscale things. And the idea here is you review this once a week, probably just inside the sales organization, but once a month and then certainly once a quarter where you do, do a readout and say, where are we, in which of these cells are we green, in which are we red, in which are we yellow. Now, I have red here as, as, a, as a color for the row, but I mean red, yellow, green in terms of a stoplight. So when you do this, the kind of mistakes people make, and this is the kind of thing you can probably see in your organization, uh, allowing subscale columns or rows into the matrix. You have a product line that is it's a new product, it's maybe 1 or 2% of revenue, and you've put it into the performance zone, it'll get lost. So it's just, you, 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 you've got, it cannot be, it's got to be at least 10% or it's going to get lost. So you have to solve for that problem. The incubation zone helps solve for it at the beginning. The transformation zone helps solve for it at the end. But you can't just put it in the performance zone. Um, assigning row responsibility to junior executives, you often see like a product line manager owning a row and they're going up against the senior vice president of sales. It just doesn't work. You have to have general managers running the rows. And probably worst of all, this failure to secure interlock. Most companies say, well, if you make your green number, if the column guy makes his number, why do we really care whether what rows it comes from? But then you leave the row people completely out to lunch. So it's very important to, 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 to get interlock. If you do get interlock, you're going to get early detection of performance misses, which is great, which means you can correct them before, before you know, the end of the year. Your swift remedial action can happen at the cell level, and you get increasingly reliable forecasting. So good discipline in the performance zone is important. 
That said, if you're not being disrupted this year, you can probably get away with somewhat sloppy behavior. That's how companies get sloppy. But, in it, but under the pressure of disruption, you won't be able to do that. So these are good, are good principles to up your game right now, maybe even if you're not being disrupted, to get ready to be disrupted. Okay, we'll go to the next one. So the productivity zone, most of the people on this call, I suspect, are in the productivity zone. The job here is to produce programs and systems for compliance, efficiency, and effectiveness. So if you look at these kind of organizations we see in the productivity zone, you know, marketing, central engineering, procurement, customer support, enterprise IT, quality control, supply chain, human resources, legal facilities, administration, and finance, I suspect many of you are, are here, and you say, okay, so what do we owe, what's our mission? What's our, what is the, when they give us funding uh, in Horizon One, what do they want back from us? And they want back from us one, one or more of three things. They would like you to make our performance zone and in fact our whole company more effective and do that by delivering programs. And I'll say some more words about programs in just a minute. Also, we need to make ourselves more efficient and that requires systems and I'll say some more words about that in a minute. And then we also need to maintain regulatory control, so please monitor and verify compliance so that we don't have to go to jail. Now, the, the last one is sort of non-negotiable, and it, it just has to be done. It has to be done correctly. But there's a lot of discretion around the first two. How do you invest against efficiency and effectiveness? How do you invest, invest against systems and programs? And when we look into the productivity zone and we look at how things get a little bit sloppy here and what, what, what you have to, where you have to up your game if you're going to be uh, entertaining a disruptive innovation, the key idea here is programs and systems are actually very different animals. I'll kind of put both of these up and walk you through the, the comparison. A program is designed to change the state of something, change the state of a customer, change the state of an organization, change the state of a partner. And, and, and the, the person who's funding the program is buying that change of state from the people who are producing the program. This program here, I want to change my state as an employable individual. I want to change my state as, a, as an innovator in a large corporation. That's why I'm taking a class from Stanford, that kind of idea. A system is designed to maintain state. It doesn't change state, it maintains state. It keeps things running as they are. So if you look at programs, they should be optimized for effectiveness that in effectively making the change, where systems would be optimized for efficiencies. And programs are highly customized. It's very important that they meet the user's needs. Systems are very standardized, and in fact, the user has to adapt to the system in order for it to be efficient. And, and so as a program should be funded by the person who wants the change of state. It's usually, it, often it's a, it's a salesperson in the performance zone or a product person in the performance zone. They need a marketing program or they need a hiring program or whatever it is they need to change the state of their organization or change the state of their customer or market. And, and, and systems should be centrally funded and they're largely internally focused and they're designed to make us more efficient. So the key idea here is you attack problems with programs and then you lock the solutions in with systems. You, you can't, you, you, and the key idea is do not blend them. Most of the slippage that we see in this zone where you, where you just get frustration both inside the zone and, with, and the customers of the zone also get frustrated is we end up m matching systems against program problems or programs against systems problems or we just don't make the distinction at all and we just throw money at something. We'll take a program budget and use it to repair a system, that kind of stuff. It creates all kinds of dissatisfaction. So the kinds of mistakes that we see that, that you might want to test for in your organization, again, particularly if you're going into a disruptive period, do we, are, we, are we actually rolling out a system and the, with the idea that we're going to change state? A lot of people did this, you know, we're going to roll out a big ERP system and change the state of our company. No, you're not. An ERP system maintains state. If you want to change the state, you have to do a change management program first and then put the system in behind it. The second one, and the one that's kind of the saddest one, is you run programs, they're very good programs, everybody likes them, they're kind of like Barney programs, everybody likes everybody, but they don't change anything. So you go to the program and you don't, you don't achieve a change in state. That was a waste of time. And then the last one is systems that accommodate too many exception conditions, where basically, well, we have a system, but I like to do it my way, or in my country we do it differently, and all of a sudden, whatever efficiency goals you had are, are out the window because you don't really have a system. You have many systems, and there's huge exception routines, and now you have just a raft of people working through the exceptions. 
So if you can nail the program systems distinction and you can nail the, 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 the deployment of programs and systems effectively, you'll get faster and more agile responses to emerging requirements because you'll be able to put a program right on it. You'll have greater impact on the performance zone and you'll have more efficient use of funds with, because you'll put the system in behind the program, capture the gains of the program and then run it, run it going forward. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you kind of a flavor of each one of these things because we're going to get to the transformation zone as the main idea here. But I want to give you a flavor that even businesses use, and again, if you're not terrific at this in your company right now and you're not being disrupted, you can get away with a lot of sloppy behavior here. But if you get disrupted and all of a sudden resources become very scarce, this, you're going to wish that you'd done some, some cleanup before that had begun. So now we'll look at the incubation zone. So the incubation zone is a very different charter. It's, it, it, it's typically much smaller. It's a relatively small amount of the total budget. And it's been hived off. It doesn't have a number. It, it has a different kind of accountability. Its job is to essentially catch the future in a bottle and create options for the company to potentially participate in the next wave of disruption. And the idea is not to catch every wave. The idea is not to be caught flat-footed. So you want to at least have a sense of what the wave's about. And then from that inventory, you'd like to eventually pick waves that you're going to commit to. So in that world, one of the lessons we've had is we used to do this with labs. We'd say we'd have an R&D lab, and there were Bell Labs, IBM Labs, HP Labs, Nokia Labs, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge with the lab is that by the time you get something out of the lab, it's, so, it's still so immature, you can't really transition the technology to a division. So what we've learned in the last 10 or 15 years is you're better off in the incubation zone building independent operating units that look a lot, more, a lot like startups. So what you want to do is kind of copy the venture, the venture capital people here. And you, you, can, you can often start these by doing a small tuck-in acquisition. You buy a small company to kind of get it, get it going. But you want to have a general manager and all of the sales and marketing and engineering and services and support services that you need to run a little startup should all be uh, local to that, to that, uh, that effort. The second thing you need to do is you need to put this funding under a, a, a separate entity. This should not be part of the annual funding process. This needs its own incubation fund, its own venture-style fund. And, and the idea here is that then anybody in the company can pitch the incubation fund just like, a, at, like at, a, at a shark tank where, you know, you can come and say, listen, I, I think I have a great idea. We should, you should incubate it as an independent operating unit. Uh, that then creates a point of control for this. You have a lot of creative people in your company, and right now they don't know where to go with, it, with, it, with an idea, and, they, and, and so as a result, you have a lot of people running around. This is a great way to centralize and control it. And then the third thing is these independent operating units need special attention. They can't really participate in the standard finance, the standard HR, the standard administration, the standard annual planning process. And so what you want to do is put a, a, a liaison group which essentially is designed specifically to make sure that we don't go to jail with what these people do, but to give them services that are more flexible and more oriented toward a startup thing. So this is a way. This is a, this is kind of how a venture firm is organized, and, and there's a way to take this and put this inside a company. Uh, some of the key ideas: um, the IOUs need general managers, not R&D technical project leads. Entrepreneurs. So this is where you want to have an entrepreneur who's building a business. And so that's why they have to have all the functions reporting into them. That's how they can learn fast. That's how they can do the lean startup, minimum viable product, you know, minimum, getting through what some people are now calling the traction gap to get to minimum viable traction, that whole idea. And so the way you fund these things is instead of saying, well, you have a year's worth of funding, it's much more, this is why you need an incubation fund with a board, you, you do the venture style funding. I will give you seed funding to see if you can give me a proof of concept. I will give you series A funding to see if you can give me a minimum viable product and some early customers. Series B, maybe you could win an entire beachhead market. That's where you would cross the chasm potentially. Series C, maybe you exit the scale. But the point is you don't do this as part of an annual process. These things typically do not take a year, and it's very important to hold IOUs, independent operating units, accountable to hitting their milestone or, frankly, not getting funded or, or maybe getting one more chance to bite at the apple, but not just getting an annual, uh, annual re-up, as it were. So the funding and reviews happen outboard of the annual plan. And then it turns out 
there's, there's a lot of ways you can, you can exit from this process. So the one that we're, we're betting on, the one we're going to get to next is you go into the transformation zone. Your independent operating unit is the unit that we bet on big at the corporation. That's the whole point in a sense of the zone. But there are five other exits that are, that are, that are also viable. And the second one is actually uh, uh, often um, more common and, and, and highly valuable. And that is, well, we didn't actually decide to bet on your business as a new business, but we think you've invented something that we can incorporate into one of our existing businesses and give it a, what we would call a midlife kicker. So it's not a home run. The home run is transformation zone, but it's a single or maybe even a double. It's, it's actually, it's a base hit. So it's actually quite a good thing. And a, and a lot of innovation ends up going into the performance zone and it's very, very welcome uh, when it does. But it doesn't disrupt. Now, now you're accommodating the existing business. You're not disrupting it. Some of the technology actually doesn't get commercialized, so it doesn't go to the transformation zone or the performance zone. It doesn't go into a revenue uh, uh, path, but it still can be used internally for a lot better productivity. And so another way you can take some of these technologies is to take them into the productivity zone. So these are three very positive outcomes going forward. A fourth thing is, you know, you did a great job. It just isn't us. We're not going to make this bet for whatever reason, but we think it, this is a bet worth making. If, why don't we spin you out and let private capital outside of the company to take you forward and see where you can go and, 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 and you know, kind of unleash, unleash the, the Kraken, as it were. Uh, the fifth thing is, well, it didn't work as well as we hoped, but you made some assets. We can sell them. And the sixth one is, hey, you know, we tried. It didn't work. We're going to shut it down. The point is that there are very clear exits from this thing, and what the board has to do is what we call in venture force and exit. What you cannot allow these things to do is just stay in place. The, the, these spaces in the, in, the, in the incubation zone are so valuable, it's important to, to turn them over rapidly and to get a result, one of these six results going forward. So again, if you're not, if you're, if you're not doing this, um, typically if you don't have an incubation zone, you, what will happen is you'll, you'll protect these things for a while, but sooner or later you'll expose them to the performance zone and the performance zone will say, well, where are the numbers? And the numbers won't look very good and so you're going to have a lot of things that die on the vine because they just can't, it's, it's premature to put them in the performance zone but you have no other place to put them. Uh, when you share go-to-market resources with the performance zone, you also have the problem that at the end of the day their first job is to make their number. You're not going to really help them make their number so you get second priority on go-to-market. When you're a young startup, that's, a, that's death. This is why startups routinely beat large companies, because in a startup, a true startup, a venture-backed startup, they have, there's only one place to, that everybody in that company has only one goal that they're aligned around. They may not succeed, but they're not conflicted. In a large company, they're virtually always conflicted. And then the third thing is we weren't really holding the IOUs accountable for venture milestones. We would account them, we'd have something called stage gates, Stage gates are good for sustaining innovation for that funnel. They are not good for disruptive innovation, venture milestones, or what you want there. Now, if you do put this thing in place, you're going to get some really exciting returns. This playbook, this notion of adopting the venture playbook, it can be very powerful in your company. Viable business with very high growth rates is, is, is obviously the, the key idea, but also products to supplement existing businesses and also technology to improve productivity. So there's a lot to gain here. Again, right now, most companies don't do anything quite this formal, and as a result, their innovation efforts are interesting, but boy, it's hard to get traction with them without something like this to put in place. Okay, so those are the three zones that we, you see. These are separate areas of your corporation. You can probably find these in different buildings, and you can probably make a pretty clear determination, is my job in the performance zone, in the productivity zone, or in the incubation zone? The fourth zone is the one that's been the real challenge. We call it the transformation zone. And the key deliverable here, we're going to see there's actually two versions of this, but the key one, the one that people care the most about, is we're going to take a disruptive innovation and we are going to make it into a material business. We are going to be, it is going to be our next big thing. The way Apple made the iPod their next big thing and then they made the iPhone their next big thing after that and then they made the iPad their next big thing after that the way Amazon's done with AWS. But as we know, there are not a lot of companies that have done this. And so why is this so hard? So what we're going to try to do here is we've, we've got this, let's suppose we've got an incubation zone of some kind and we've been developing um, uh, Horizon 3 independent operating units in the zone and we have a, a performance matrix in the performance zone in Horizon 1. So the goal of the transformation zone is to take a business out of the Horizon 3 incubation zone through the transformation zone 
and, and have it land as a, as a fully fledged business in the performance matrix, meaning it's 10% or more of total revenue by the time we, we, we unleash it uh, and, and kind of let it, let, you know, let it graduate, if you will, from the transformation zone. So what we're going to do is we're going to navigate the, the bottleneck in the hourglass. This is the mechanism by which we solve for the bottleneck. So what exactly are we going to do in the transformation zone? So the key idea here is this is not business as usual. So let me kind of walk through these ideas. The first idea is if you start a transformation, that commitment trumps all other commitments. Now the commitment is to scale the new business to 10% of total revenue. Failure is not an option. What that means is everybody's badge is on the table. It's not just the leader of the independent operating unit and the CEO who are trying to get this done. Every direct report on the executive staff has to have a stake in this game because every one of them can make a contribution. And more importantly, if any one of them withholds even a little bit of support, they can create just enough inertia to make sure it never happens. So making the horizon one number, if you're in the performance zone, if you're the head of sales or one of these other product lines that are, you're going to make room for a new product line in the performance zone, you're kind of jealous of your resources and you say, well, look, I, I, you can't do this to me because I have to make my number. And the answer, and, and if, if you, do you want me to make my number? And the correct answer is, of course we want you to make your number, but this is more important than you making your number. Once we start a transformation, we must not fail. And so therefore, your compensation, and as you see in the second, in the second uh, set of bullets, your compensation will be tied to this one outcome, your discretionary compensation. Not all of it, but enough of it so that you will not be a very happy person if this thing doesn't succeed. And this thing is probably going to take a couple of years. So this is a longer term compensation. Uh, but you have to have the board of directors behind this because it's going to take, you're going to go through a J curve. It's going to put your stock price uh, at risk. The only person who has the power to do this is a CEO. You cannot delegate this task because you're going to ask every other zone, as we'll see on the next slide, to make a sacrifice. The only person who has the authority to ask all the three other zones to sacrifice is the CEO. So, and, and the CEO is the only one who can really orchestrate the, the shift in resources because you're going to put a whole bunch of resources behind something that at the beginning looks totally inappropriate uh, to get that kind of funding. But this is what it's going to take to get through the transformation. The key milestones, you start with an IOU and an entrepreneurial GM that you believe in. You're going to grow it in order of magnitude. Maybe, maybe it's like 1% of revenue that it's gotten to a certain size in the incubation zone. Now you're going to take it to 10%. You're going to enter, and, and you're probably going to do some M&A in order to get there because organically, the bigger you are, the less likely you can do it all organically. And you're going to end this thing as a row in the performance matrix. That's what's going to declare victory. That's what, that's what the Apple and Amazon, and that's why, by the way, Apple stock price went up a gazillion. It went up like 50 times when the average tech company's tech price went up two during, during the last, um, say, 10 years. And so in that model, uh, uh, there's a big prize. That's why you can align executive compensation, because you just give them stock, stock options. And, and if, you, if you really do expand your portfolio, there's a very big prize for everybody, but only if it gets to 10% or more of total revenue with good contribution margins looking like an exciting new business, the way music did for Apple, the way, the way phones did for Apple, et cetera. Now, this is not for the faint of heart because everybody has to make serious sacrifices to make this work. The performance zone has to donate 10% of its resources to the transformation. To make the number with the other 90% is really painful. As we said, the sales motion is inefficient. I mean, there's just all kinds of grief there. The productivity zone has got to develop a bunch of programs and, and, and improve systems just to squeeze any kind of resource to help fund this thing. And the incubation zone has got to realize once we've declared one company as our focus, nobody else can compete for the transformation zone, so they have to find another exit. So it's massively disruptive across the board. That's why the CEO must lead. You cannot delegate this to anybody else. Nobody else can, can, can garner the respect. And you also can never do two at the same time, even though it might seem like you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Believe me, chickens lay eggs one at a time. And that's the way this, that's the, the model you have to have in your mind. So what happens, what do people do? Uh, why did those 54 companies fail? Most of them did try to do more than one transformation at a time. That's a complete non-starter. It's so stressful to do one, there's just no chance you could do two. They often withdrew support halfway through. When you withdraw support halfway through, you signal to the world you're not quite as committed as they thought, and then everybody who was on the fence says, okay, and they pull back, so you never reach the tipping point. And, and the other way is you let 
you let one or more major executives just say, well, this is not my problem, I'm not going to support this, everybody has to support it or it won't happen. You cannot have internal conflict, and normally you do have internal conflict. So big problems, not trivial to, to solve for, uh, but if you do solve for them, lots, lots of prizes for success. New high growth business added to the portfolio, you know, by the way, that also creates a halo effect for your existing businesses. Think about the Macintosh business at Apple, a dramatic increase in market capitalization, a huge, huge, huge prize. So very much worth doing, but, 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 not, but not easy. So just to kind of bring this to a close, I'm going to turn this back over to Ronnie. Um, how does this, this, this fra these frameworks, and by the way, the frameworks are in the book called Zone to Win. I've kind of given you a, a, a kind of a race through it, but, but the, the, they are available in, in the book if you want to kind of dig into them deeper. How do you use these frameworks, and we say to attack, defend, and maintain? So the attacking idea is the one we've been talking about so far, which is we have a star in the incubation zone, and, and we've decided as a management team with the CEO leading that we are going to make it, we're going to make this the center of our transformational effort. And so that's become the number one priority in our company. Now, the performance zone is still number two, and the productivity zone, we need a lot of help from them. So that's kind of our, our, our footprint is to sort of put those three together. By the way, the incubation zone, do not apply for any uh, additional funding at this time. In fact, we're going to ask, we may force some additional exits in order to reduce the drag on the other three zones. And everybody is, enlist everyone in scaling the new business. The key idea here is that the entire company prioritizes the transformation zone uh, business, regardless of what zone they live in, regardless of what their day job is, their number one priority becomes this new business must get to scale no matter what. So it's a very different agenda than has normally been used in the past, and certainly the 54 companies that didn't catch the next wave did not make it that kind of a priority. And, and, that, and as a consequence, I believe that's the, one of the key uh, critical factors that, that caused them not to be successful. Now, one of the things we learned as we were doing this is, you know, sometimes it's not that you have the disruption, it's that somebody is disrupting you. So Microsoft became a very interesting case study in our book. Salesforce was sort of an example of the first of the, of the zone offense. Microsoft became a great example of zone defense. They have some very, very powerful businesses that are getting disrupted. Their back office software by Amazon Web Services and cloud in general, their office business by Google Apps, their Windows business by mobile, mobile devices, iOS and Android. So they're under attack. So when your business is under attack, direct attack by a highly powerful disruptive innovation, you cannot fix that business if you leave it in the performance zone because you've got to do, you've got to do kind of surgery on it. So the idea is, and this is what Microsoft has done, they brought businesses into their transformation zone and made it the number one priority. The first one they did was with their back office software. They, it was all on premise. They made Azure Cloud their priority, even though Azure Cloud was not as profitable as the back office software business, they made it their priority. They've now gotten that past the tipping point. They put it back in the performance zone. Right now, Office is their priority. Again, online Office, or what they call Office 365, not as profitable as buying it, selling it on the devices, but it is the future. Bring it into the transformation zone. Go through a J-curve. Accept the fact that your revenues and profits are going to go down before they go up and move forward. By the way, when you're doing this play, you go into the incubation zone and you rob it for any technology that can help you modernize your existing business as fast as possible. So that's not probably why the technology was being incubated. It was probably somebody had a dream of maybe being the disruptor, but now you're saying, no, 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 we're the disruptee. We need you to help us defend ourselves against the disruptors. And yes, eventually we, 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 we're still worried about the performance zone, but frankly, we need to get ourselves back into health. So we, we have a pattern that looks like this. And under this pattern, everyone is enlisted in stabilizing the current business, and, and that becomes the number one priority again. So the number one priority is stabilize this business, get it back to health, typically by modernizing its operating model so that it can compete more effectively with the disruptor. And then finally, there are years where you're not being disrupted. Either you're not doing it, nobody's doing it to you. So in those years, that's the year where the performance zone is the top dog. Making the number is the number one priority. The productivity zone is, is, is enlisted to do that. 
and the incubation zone is creating options for the future. This is a time to make money. We call it harvest your rewards, build up your reserves. So this is actually a great time for a company because you can deliver on what your investors want, on what your customers want, on what your employees want. You might even get home at night before 6 o'clock. It's a great time. So just to recap, and then I'll turn it back over to Ronnie. Um, the challenge, again, the waves of innovation, I think, are inescapable. The design rules for the world are changing. The, the challenge when we double-click on it is this Horizon 2 problem. The zone management framework is designed to cope with that problem by isolating two of the Horizon 1 zones, the performance zone where you deliver the number, the productivity zone where you do all the work behind the scenes, as well as isolating the incubation zone where you create options for the future. And then the key idea is the transformation zone, which isn't really a, an organizational zone as much as it's the CEO's number one priority for the company. That's how the zones work. And then we just saw it right here that you can either do that zone offense where you are the disruptor, zone defense when you're the disruptee, or between waves when you're essentially working at, uh, of, you know, working, essentially making hay while the sun is shining. So that I want to say, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. I hope uh, we can answer some questions here. I'm going to turn it back over to Ronnie. Uh, one of the questions that came up, Jeffrey, was if you're a CFO or CEO of a company, how do you decide how much funding you'd like to allocate to the incubation zone, and how do you measure the success of, of that? Yeah, I, I think it, obviously in good years you might want to allocate a little bit more, in, in lean years a little less. And obviously, if you're feeling disruptive closer, you're going to spend more or less. It's not much. Let me put it that way. I mean, I would be, I would say normally the spending is going to happen in the transformation zone. So you would expect it to be a few percent of annual revenue, but not a lot more than that. The teams, frankly, are, are, are you want to keep them small. Small teams are not that expensive. You might do a tuck-in acquisition. That, you might, that might be an additional expense, yeah. Okay. Um, do you have an example of a product? You talked briefly about Apple. Do you have some other ex example of successful products that went through the incubation uh, zone and were then uh, moved out? Yeah. So if you look at the, 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 most, the most common successes in tech are typically founder-driven companies. So the Apple example, because obviously Steve Jobs, you can turn to a Jeff Bezos at Amazon, and clearly Amazon Web Services went through a, a, a process like this. Uh, you look at Mark Benioff at Salesforce, and, and, and the way it was interesting is how they added Marketing Cloud. So they, Marketing Cloud, they bought a company called Buddy, uh, Buddy Media. They bought a company called Radiant 6. They were not getting enough traction. They were in the incubation zone, but they were not coming together. They bought a company called Exact Target, which gave them enough mass. And then Mark made that exact target the priority for the company for two years in a row in the transformation zone. And as a result, they were able to drive that to more than 10% of revenue. It's now a full-fledged row in the performance matrix. But, it, but classically, if you don't, if you don't, uh, uh, if the board and the CEO do not align around this one commitment and get everybody's, everybody on the exact team committed to it, uh, founders do that by just by simply making life intolerable for you if you don't commit. But but I think we need a more organizational approach to the problem. Um, so as a follow-on to that, one of the participants is asking, what if there is uh, not full alignment at the top level of the company around making such a change? Are there things that can be done on the ground by, you know, right. lo lower level people? So the answer for a transformation zone is no. And in fact, I would argue that that is the normal status quo. Most companies are, I mean, it's rare that you have a leader at the top who wants to, to embrace transformational leaders. Not that rare, but let's say it would, not be un, it would not be unsurprising to have one who is more conservative. If that's the case, then just don't go to the transformation zone. In other words, you take most of your innovations from the incubation zone and slot them into the performance zone or slot them into the uh, productivity zone and take advantage of your innovation in the context of sustaining innovations rather than disruptive. Now, the one time where you are going to need uh, to, to, to kind of gird your loins is if you get directly attacked in one of your flagship businesses by a disruptor, then zone defense does have to be implemented, and that does have to be implemented by the CEO. But I think a CEO under attack is maybe more likely to make these changes than a CEO who has options. Okay. 
Uh, so we have a question from somebody who's an employee in, the, in a productivity zone of one of the companies and is, and is asking how does he recognize a company or an area that's going to be successful in this age of disruption if they're looking to, to move away from the productivity zone. Oh, okay. Well, but before, before you decide to move away from the productivity zone, I sure hope you give some thought into this program system distinction because the productivity zone is the unsung hero of every corporation. It's actually where you can accomplish the most change uh, because, because, because you have the most discretion over, over, over the funding and, and what, what it's doing. But I think in general, if you're saying, look, I just need to get into a, a faster moving company, I think to find any company that is aligned with one of those five waves that we talked about, cloud computing, mobile computing, social networking, uh, internet, data sciences or internet of things, and it doesn't have to be in tech, it, but if just if the company is, is kind of riding one of those waves already, they're kind of on the wave, then I think you're going to have, uh, if that company has a, a leg up on its competition. Um, so if you have a few uh, products in the incubation zone that seem to all be equally likely to succeed, how do you decide which one of them to move to the transformation zone? It's a great question, and, and there's not a, 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 a formulaic answer to that. The point is you have to choose one. And, and if you fret too much about, oh my gosh, what if I choose the wrong one? Just rest assured that not choosing is worse than choosing. So, so, so and then the second thing is, but the worst thing you can do is to choose two. Or, 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 or to, if you dither, what will happen is all three will race for the exit at the same time because they, they're all ambitious. And then you'll, you'll overload the, the, the company and, and you condemn all of them to death. So it, it really, Picking one, this is, it's an act of courage, but it's also an act of, of mercy. <laughs> For, and frankly, it's increasing your odds. Um, how about the reward system in these different zones? Do they, are they different in any way? Totally different. So, so the performance zone is all about horizon one compensation rewards and should be. So sales, you want salespeople to be coin operated. That's the whole, that's the way sales comp is designed to work. In the productivity zone, frankly, the rewards are largely, uh, uh, you get, you get, you can get a, a, a bonus, a shared bonus, but what it's really more about is I'm doing what I love. I like being in service to, 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 to my customers. I like to, I like to provide the services that we get to provide in my function. And so it, it, it's much more of a, I like to, I, I'm getting a, a personal reward from that and I'm being paid at the same time and I'm doing interesting work. The incubation zone is, it, it's like a venture capital startup except you're not going to get stock options. So if you want to get, if you want to take that kind of risk, you should actually go, go form a startup because many startups flame out and, and, and that's, that's, that's a real risk. Um, in, a, an incubation zone inside a corporation, you, you're still taking a risk. But it's, a, it's kind of a guarded risk. So what you get to do, the reward there, the metrics there are about I get to create the next big thing. And I have a chance of maybe becoming a, a general manager of a major business in this company if we pick mine that's scale it. All right. So we have a question here about someone interested about the, your thoughts on the 70-20-10 kind of uh, time management system applied at Google, uh, PG&E, and other places. Does that fall in line with, the, with this model or not? Or? Well, so I, th I think what the, the, that time management system is designed to do is to share time between the performance zone and the incubation zone or between the productivity zone and the incubation zone. And it's sort of a horizon one, horizon three split, if you will. Uh, I think I, th I think it, I, I think do not think it answers the transformation zone issue at all. Uh, I think in a transformation zone, it's much more about an issue of priority. Meaning, I don't if you're not if you're not right in the middle of the transformation business, I don't need a lot of your time. I just need to be the first. I just need to have top of mind whenever I do need your time. So the, the biggest the biggest killer of a transformation is latency delay. I make a request and and I they say I'll help you, but I can't help you this week. It's death in a transformation. So that, that's what that, so it's not a percentage resource, it's prioritization of resource. So I would like to thank uh, everyone again who have joined us here online, uh, as well as Jeffrey Moore, of course, for sharing uh, his uh, great research and writing uh, about this, uh, the four zones. And I encourage you all to uh, check out our website, scpd.stanford.edu, and the remainder of our programs, as well as if you're interested, uh, please go ahead and uh, take a deeper dive into, the, into Jeffrey's book, uh, Zone to Win. Thank you all very much for joining us, and have a good rest of your day.